which we conceive today, our own foreign policies and the way in which we confront the rest of the world. Were there attempts to develop agency in Latin America during the Cold War? The book mentions, of course, the case of Cuba and the building of agency through overt conflict with the United States. But it seems to me that in the, ca in, in the case of the rest of the Latin American countries, there is a certain overstatement of this sort of prisoner's dilemma. Not, every, not everything Latin American countries did at the time was in reference to conflict with the US, or at least they did not see it under that light. For example, not all countries that displayed goodwill towards Cuba during the Cold War were guided by the need to express independence from the US. Most countries in South America, like Chile and Argentina, for example, approached Cuba, sometimes in violation of the Organization of American States agreements, simply because they thought Cuba's iso isolation was unjust, was counterproductive, or was simply idiotic. But apart from that, apart from that, there were some governments with very friendly relations with Washington during the 60s, and I'm referring to Eduardo Freis in Chile, or Carlos Lleras in Colombia, or Romulo Betancourt and Raúl Leoni in Venezuela, that developed very active policies of regional integration and were extremely attracted by the creation of the European Union. Frey's famous trip to Europe in 1965 sought to equilibrate the foreign policy of Chile, matching the ex excellent relations with the US with the attraction of investment and the association with European, French, Italian and Br British businesses, political parties, cultural organizations, etc. Of course, these governments had differences with the United States. Some of them were indicative of a certain paranoia that the Cold War produced in this country and was not shared in South America. If I can, uh, I have still time, sure. I could relate to you a very personal story that I will never forget because I was 16 years old and my father was foreign minister and I lived it directly. I listened to it in person. Frey was going to go to Europe, and this was a big trip. He was being, he, wa he, he, he would be received by de Gaulle, he would see Adenauer, he would see the Queen of England. For a Latin American president, this was a unique occasion. No previous Latin American president had been received in Europe as Eduardo Frey was received. In one of the meetings preparing this visit, there was a very marginal and uh, secondary comment linked to Carabineros de Chile, the Chilean police. Frey asked my father, who was foreign minister, do you have any idea of how we could ameliorate the preparation, the training of these policemen? Of course, we sent some of them to the US, but some European policemen are good and then we could send some of them to Europe. And then my father, who had, been a had, had had a scholarship in France, said, oh, the Parisian police is quite a thing. I have seen them confronting students without killing anybody and uh, uh, putting order in 20 minutes. Why don't you, why don't we contact them and tell them we want to give scholarships to some Ch Chilean carabineros to go there? Two days before the trip, there was a message from the American embassy saying that Mr. Averill Harriman, I don't need to explain, to say anything about him, wanted to see President Frey as soon as he came to Paris. Everybody was puzzled. Nobody understood why somebody like Averill Harriman wanted to see Frey during his visit to Europe. They arrived in Europe and they received Mr. Harriman in the hotel and Mr. Harriman, after commenting the excellent relations between President Frey's government and the US government, at the time President Johnson, said to President Frey that the United States considered that the idea of training carabineros in France was not only a bad idea, but was an idea which did not follow the 
concepts of security that the U.S. had on the region. My father commented this to me, and I couldn't believe it. He couldn't believe it either. It was surreal. Well, the decision was to send half the policemen to the U.S. and half the policemen to France. But you can imagine for a Chilean president to receive this sort of comment in the middle of a trip to Europe, uh, it was extremely difficult for us and for Latin Americans to share this perception of what the Cold War meant in terms of security for the United States. What I think is important, therefore, to underline is that when there were differences between the U.S. and some of these governments, uh, what it showed was the total subordination to security consideration, as Talchin mentions, of conversations about democracy, development, and social reforms, and human rights. This was very difficult for Latin American governments, and it is expressed also in what was called the Consenso de Viña del Mar in 67, uh, in which there was a representation. Oh, Chile represented the rest of the Latin American countries in front of President Nixon and, President and, and Secretary Kissinger. What I want to say, therefore, is that even if there was, of course, a series of restrictions uh, posed by the Cold War and by the concept the United States had of security at the time, it is evident that there was agency from the point of view of Latin, some Latin American governments and that they tended to, particularly with Europe, to create bonds that had importance at the time, not probably the importance that these actors thought uh, or sought, but uh, were important in terms of the development of our societies, clearly. Let me come now to the points of Latin American agency after the end of the Cold War, which is probably the most gr groundbreaking and innovative part of Professor Talchin's work. His uh, reflection on the role of Real and the group of academics or proto-academics gathered by Luciano Tomassini is enormously relevant. They were not only a new generation of intellectuals dedicated to the analysis of foreign policy, but they became, after the return of democracy, the main actors in the foreign policy of Chile, of Argentina, some of Brazil and Ecuador, among others. Th there are two observations I would like to stress on this group of which I am part. The first is that these academics broke the old mold, mold of juridical analysis that was typical of internationalists in our countries and con continues to be even today the most important trend in the type of analysis we make of what is going on. The analysis of international law and the analysis of treaties was foreign policy and was international relations. This was not, of course, the approach that people in Real had. The second observation is very political. We belonged, all of us, practically without exception. I was trying to find one exception and I couldn't. We belonged to parties on the left or on the center left in our countries. And most of us had studied in the United States. These characteristics led, in my understanding, to two consequences. We were more than simply aware of the excesses and crimes of the Cold War. But at the same time, we had demystified Washington. We saw its contradictions and internal conflicts. And by living among Americans, we appreciated their diversity and their sense of community and tolerance. In some, we came to understand and admire the enormous value of American de democracy and the extent and limits of its international power. In these conditions, we were able to identify spaces of cooperation and to root our differences not in world visions or in broad ideological debates, but in concrete issues. To me, nothing was more indicative of this conception in which I joined the concept of appreciation of the United States, cooperation with the United States, and sometimes discrepancy 
on some specific issues than the conflict over the Iraq war and the creation of MINUSTA in Haiti, in which I was a participant. Allow me to introduce this final point. Chile was the first country in South America to be interested in signing a free trade agreement with the United States. And excuse me, this was not an American idea. Alejandro Foxley, our Minister of Finance, unexpectedly, without even the permission of the President, reacted favorably to President Bush's discourse on the free trade of the Americas uh, initiative. But instead of offering to join a broad group of countries negotiating with the United States, offered to immediately initiate bilateral negotiations, leading to a free trade agreement. An idea which seemed outlandish at the time, considering the dimensions of both economies and the little importance that the economy of Chile might have to the United States. Foxley had been strongly influenced by his conversation with the Mexicans, who were already exploring their possibilities to join the US-Canada free trade agreement. I have to tell you that this is also related to the fact that most of us were exiles in Mexico for years. Therefore, we knew the Mexicans. We knew the Mexican government, and we had built bond of solidarity, affection, and even complicity with some of the most important Mexican politicians. Therefore, the first visit, the day of the inauguration of President Elwin, was the visit of the President of Mexico, and the first thing he did was to offer a free trade agreement to Chile, something we accepted immediately. Well, this initiative, which brought us some costs, of course, among our most traditional friends, Brazil and Argentina in particular, took 10 years to materialize, particularly due to the difficulties in the American Congress to concede the president the authority to negotiate. The point I want to make is that when we had just finished the negotiation and when we were about to sign the treaty, we became members of the Security Council of the UN and confronted the US on the war in Iraq. Let me make here this small correction to Joe. I was the Chilean ambassador sitting in the Security Council when, uh, when we said no to the proposed resolution declaring war on Iraq. The American ambassador was my friend John Negroponte, not John Bolton. And yes, the Mexican ambassador was my dear friend Adolfo Aguilar Sincer. But what is important is that when I discuss with President Lagos the consequence of this action, my argument, having been already trade negotiator with the US, was more or less the following. Mr. President, our bonds with the United States are too deep and relevant for this issue to produce a serious break among us. We have become an example of the type of relationship that the Grand Potencia can have with a democratic developing country in the world. I'm sure Washington will be angry, but it will not last long. And I was right. The treaty was not signed by the presidents, but by the negotiator. It was not signed in Washington, but in Miami. That was all the punishment we got. But when 20 days later, Secretary Powell called President Lagos and asked him to assist the U.S. in front of the political disaster that was approaching Haiti, Lagos not only accepted, but also dispatched in 72 hours a Chilean military battalion to Port-au-Prince. And one month later, I was assuming at head of MINUSTA in Haiti. Cooperation between the Bush administration and the Chilean government was reestablished in all fronts, and the free trade agreements with the U.S. has been one of the most successful treaties signed by Chile. I wanted to recall this, uh, this uh, story and this uh, argument, because I believe that it is a fact that Latin American countries have become, during the last two decades, 
more independent and more autonomous between themselves. The dream, the Bolivarian dream of integration among us continues to be an idea, but it is clear that when countries discuss their association, they look at their commercial and trade organization. They look at their economy and they look at the way in which they want to insert themselves in the international system. When Chile negotiated with Mercosur, we joined Mercosur because we thought that it was impossible to us to be separated from Argentina and Brazil. But we were clear that we would not raise our tariffs in order to become full members of an organization which was based on protectionism. When our main objective was to insert ourselves in globalization. The same is happening today between Mercosur and the Alliance for the of the Pacific. The Alliance of the Pacific wants to attract Mercosur, but not to the point of destroying the concept that bases the Alliance of the Pacific. All of its countries have agreements with the US. All of its countries want to accede the uh, Asian economies through TPP. This doesn't mean that we want to establish a sort of separation between the Pacific and the Atlantic. What I mean to say is that Joe Tolchin is perfectly right when he said that the process of globalization and the creation of this group of people that was exposed to a different concept and vision of international relations has changed the way in which we look at our role and our place in the region and in the world. It is clear that this book also opens an enormous amount of doors to reach debates and discussions. It will become, I'm sure, required reading to any course on Latin America and US relations. I sincerely thank again his author for inviting me to comment on it. As one of the real group, I was formed listening to his name as one of the illuminated minds of academics, which opened us doors, both mental and physical, to the knowledge and understanding of the relationship between our countries and the United States. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Ambassador Valdez, was wonderful. I hope the recording will include only the last two pages of Ambassador Valdez's comments as the, with the warm praise. Thank that you. that <laughs> won't, won't be the case, but, but what an opportunity we've had to hear um, the, the, the comments of, uh, of, of Ambassador Valdez. Um, Ambassador Ainardi. Thank you, Cindy, very much. Um, thank you, Joe. Um, thank you, Juan Gabriel. Uh, thank you. Uh, extraordinary collection of uh, former colleagues and uh, current friends and acquaintances uh, in the audience. Um, I think Joe has um, written, I think, uh, an elegant book, um, which has a really useful range of um, footnotes and sources that uh, mean that anybody take picking it up, and it should be picked up and read by everyone interested in hemispheric relations, uh, will find ample uh, grist channels, avenues uh, for deepening uh, their understanding and uh, this analysis. Um, I found it extremely interesting because it is above all else, a very powerful reminder of the impact of history and memory uh, on the relations, culture, uh, on the relations um, between countries, and also uh, of the asymmetry in power that bedevils uh, the United States in its relations with its hemispheric neighbors and its hemispheric neighbors in their relations with the United States. And uh, I have um, lived through um, some of these moments which uh, form an important backdrop uh, to Joe's book, 
because actually we share also the three of us a little bit of the Chilean um, connection. And I think one of the mistakes actually that we often make, a small uh, parenthesis, is that we talk about Latin America, and Joe sometimes talks about the Latin Americans and the Latin American perspective, none of which of course exists. Uh, neither does the United States. Um, but it is true that among the three of us, we do share some uh, real exposure to Chile. And it was in Chile the first time uh, that I went to Latin America um, that I was humiliated in the Aula Magna of the University of Chile in a debate. Unfortunately, uh, I was 19 years old and uh, a representative of the uh, U.S. National Student Association and uh, my Chilean hosts had uh, put me up against Juan Jose Arevalo, um, who had been president of uh, Guatemala uh, immediately preceding um, the Arbenz period and the um, coup against him of 1954. And uh, Arevalo was a very good man. He was a, a teacher, an intellectual, um, a total, uh, he fits the description that Juan Gabriel gave of himself and many of the academics that were in the Real group, uh, let us say, moderately left of center. He was not um, a crazy radical, but he went off like a gunshot uh, at this um, uh, event, which was heavily linked to the United States and the Central Intelligence Agency and uh, the Dulles brothers, uh, and wrote a book called um, The Shark and the Sardines. Uh, and I was absolutely destroyed by, the, he, did, he humiliated me because I didn't know anything. Um, and there I was uh, exposed uh, to a whole world of perceptions and uh, views, including of the United States, that uh, didn't make much sense to me. And yet, since it was all tied into me, I had to, to some extent, spend a lot of my life uh, recovering from that, uh, from that humiliation. Um, I went from there to ultimately wind up, uh, well, I had an intermediate step, which is that, again, thanks to a Guatemalan colleague, I learned uh, that uh, strange people were uh, gathering or being gathered on a farm called Retaluleu, uh, and clearly they were being prepared to invade Cuba. So I went to see McGeorge Bundy, who was my dean at Harvard. And uh, I said to him, you know, um, this is clearly happening. It's also clearly uh, being uh, suppressed by the American press, which is true. Even the New York Times had accepted uh, to not publish information about this, uh, even though, to its honor, uh, Stanford University and its Latin American historical bulletin was publishing all kinds of stuff about it. Um, and I tried to explain this was going to be a disaster. And I went to Bundy because I'd heard, of course, that he was going to be the national security advisor of John Kennedy, who had just been elected. And um, it was the discussion I had with McGeorge Bundy also framed my life because, again, I was humiliated in the sense that I was not able to make him understand some basic things. He said that he thought there was going to be a civil war in Cuba. And I said, well, you know, maybe there's been something in the Escambra, and he cut me off. Yes, it's going to be a civil war between the communists and the liberals, 
Well, you know, the Cuban Communist Party did exist. There was a, they may, might have been able to get 15% of the vote, maybe. Uh, they had a labor base of some sort. Not as good as the Communist Party of Chile, but they still were a uh, serious party. They weren't particularly revolutionary. They hid under the bed, as Fidel Castro said. Um, but uh, they did exist. Liberals? There weren't any liberals in Cuba. Where were the Batistianos? Where were the Fidelistas? Where was, where were Cubans? And my thought was, well, all right, but uh, certainly the United States has no business getting involved in a civil war in a neighboring country. And then came uh, another sentence from this uh, brilliant American with the high dome and the enormous success. He says, yes, and besides, these people know which side their bread is buttered on, which is a marvelous expression, of course, of the sense of imperial power. So we have Guatemala, 54, we have Cuba, 60, 61, well, 59, but I wasn't involved in 59, but with first success, then failure in both cases based on an American sense of extreme power. Uh, and then I wind up at the OAS where the U.S. is forced to work on a basis of sovereign equality with its neighbors, i.e. abandoning the power, which is interesting because, of course, that's one of the reasons the U.S. doesn't pay much attention to the OAS, um, <laughs> since one of the base doctrines uh, of uh, the State Department is you deal from strength, and your strength is best bilateral. When you're big and you get one, you don't like a situation in which, like a dumbbell, the others can gather around and counterweight you. So uh, in a basic way, Joe's book uh, identifies the conditions or forces that have conditioned history, memory, asymmetry, and power, uh, the relations in the hemisphere. Um, and it is unique in a sense that's been clearly revealed here. Um, in the recording of the growth of a group of Latin American and U.S. scholars interested in international relations in, over the last quarter century, including programs here uh, sponsored by the Wilson Center. Now, I do have some uh, potential criticisms. Uh, the first is really very similar to what, I, by the way, um, what Ambassador Valdez said about the importance of that generation should not be underestimated. He said that having been trained in the United States and exposed to the United States, he and his colleagues, his generational colleagues, demystified American power. And again, I go back to uh, one of my, a little bit later, but still long ago, experiences. I gave a lecture in Lima, Peru, entitled El Sistema No Funciona, meaning El Sistema Imperial, because I had learned enough about Washington and the United States to know that there was no single Washington. There were dozens of agencies and little offices and uh, things, and each had their own policy, and some of them lied to the others, and nobody was coordinated very effectively, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We can go on and talk about the U.S. government, but I, and my interest at this point is that I gave this lecture, which was complete with um, diagrams and uh, the different offices within the Defense Department, the State Department, um, <coughs> the, the NSC, et cetera, and none of whom were in touch with each other. In fact, in, there was one year back in those days when I actually earned my keep while I was at RAND, transferring information from one part of the U.S. government to another uh, because they couldn't talk directly to each other. 
And at the end of it, a uh, Peruvian scholar, a very able man, drove me home to my hotel. And he said, Luigi, I'm sure you told us some enormous truths, but I'm sure you will discover that there is a little office with a little man in it who is pulling all those strings and is ensuring that this is a coherent, solid, imperial system at work here. And that, at least, is one of the things that you, we no longer have to face because, in fact, we are becoming much better known and understood in Latin America than we used to be. Having said that, I think the way uh, Juan Gabriel put it, uh, perhaps there is more to Latin American agency over time than uh, leaps out at you by reading Joe's book. Joe's a good historian, and he is careful, and he hasn't missed much. Uh, it's a question of emphasis. Um, Here it comes. <laughs> no, 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 there's nothing I'm, I'm not, uh, remember, I'm, I'm still a former ambassador, so even though I speak ah. freely, I... Uh, I hold my worst punches. Uh, Joe, I'll tell you later. Um, the, the agency can also be related to, if we're speaking also of somewhat more weaker countries, and it depends. I don't think that Chile really is that weak. Um, I don't think Brazil sees itself or has ever seen itself as that weak. Uh, but one of the key defenses of the weak versus the stronger is sovereignty. And I think a discussion of sovereignty is largely missing in, um, in Joe's analysis. Because when you add in an awareness of the problem of sovereignty, uh, not only do you get to uh, questions ultimately of um, respect in the treatment uh, between nations, which is one of the bases of actually being able to reach understandings, but you also have to think about things that are not heavily emphasized in this book and yet which are very important uh, to the um, emergence of uh, and assertion of Latin American views the nationalization of oil in Mexico, uh, which, you know, under Cárdenas uh, could have given us an interesting analysis of, of the role of Josephus Daniels and um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, or one that is never talked about because the way the history has gone, um, the nationalization of oil in Venezuela in 76 by Carlos Andrés Pérez and the role that Harry Schlotterman, the American ambassador there, played um, during the Nixon administration in ensuring that this would not be something that people would remember uh, because the U.S. reactions would be controlled. Um, or, uh, you know, it's interesting on the Nicaragua side, we hear more of uh, the use, the ability of one powerful gentleman, Mr. Somoza, Tacho, to use West Point and the U.S. Congress to create an American base to consolidate his power inside Nicaragua. Um, that is itself a form of agency. Or one can look at it the other way around. Carlos Andres Perez himself secretly supporting, training, and arming Sandinistas with the help of the Costa Rican government uh, against Somoza, uh, and uh, by and large with the ignorance of uh, being smart enough to keep it secret from the U.S. government. But that's also a form of agency of using power against um, the established interests of certain parts of the U.S. But there's a, there's a broader issue here. Because when we think of Latin America, we tend to think of Latin America grossly, or then we have specific countries if we like or respect them. Uh, and here uh, this afternoon it's been Chile, 
uh, one could do Latin America and Brazil, but then the Brazilians would say, we're nearly, really not part of Latin America. You'd get all these things. But there is a view, a contribution that Latin America has made to global relationships and it, their evolution that is, again, not as forcefully put forward in this book. I'm thinking of Sepal and um, Raul Prebisch. I'm thinking of the creation of OPEC, which is really the brainchild of Juan Pablo Perez Alfonso, a Venezuelan, or of UNCTAD, um, where another Venezuelan, Manuel Perez Guerrero, uh, was the key uh, um, forger, and which in turn led to the creation of the G77 within the UN, or the fact that um, the Treaty of La Telolco, the treaty for the prohibition of nuclear weapons in Latin America and the Caribbean, which earned Mexico's Alfonso Garcia Robles the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, these are questions of agency that uh, I think have helped to shape the, the entire world, not just the Western Hemisphere, um, and which are originate uh, in uh, Latin American concerns to advance, I mean, I say UNCTAD, uh, we're talking about trade and development. We're talking about um, north-south economic relations. Um, and I think that these are elements, perhaps, that are failing in today's world because I see today's world as one in which uh, things, institutions are, and relationships are fragmenting. They are gradually breaking apart and wearing down. Um, and uh, certainly I, 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 I am concerned, have been for a long time about the United Nations. Uh, it has been for the last 10 years a concern uh, for the European Union, uh, both economically and now under the pressure of the migrants and so forth, and now we think of our own political campaign. Um, so it isn't a given. Progress is not unilinear. And one can't say, well, uh, we are seeing, and Joe doesn't say this, so I'm, 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 I'm creating a false uh, dynamic, but it's for purposes of discussion. It's not as though um, suddenly the end of the Cold War, there's a breakdown of everything, but suddenly there's the flowering of uh, new uh, initiatives and new democracy. Um, progress is halting, and uh, the opportunities for mischief and for danger and difficulties are very much there. Um, let me say something else. Despite the emphasis on hegemony, uh, I think there's too much on Latin America and not enough on the United States in this book. Um, and uh, here I will take a sentence, uh, Joe. Uh, Quote, as the strategic importance of the canal declined after the war, it became easier, the war here is World War II, it became easier to return the canal to Panamanian control. Now, I, for my sins, it happens that I was the principal author of Presidential Re Review Memorandum Number 1 of the Carter administration on the Can Panama Canal negotiations because it, it was uh, seen, the, the Carter people came in with the idea that they could uh, revolutionize relations with Latin America by resolving the conflict over the Panama Canal. And that is not without merit. Look at it from the negative standpoint. Imagine if the Central American Wars had taken place without the background of a resolved Panama Canal situation. Uh, but in any case, uh, what struck me about this sentence, to return the canal to Panamanian control, well, uh, to play Trump for a minute, it wasn't theirs. Never was theirs. What do you mean, return it to Panamanian control? 
It was built, we, we, I think Teddy Roosevelt said we stole it. We didn't, well, we, we, we stole we, the land and then we built the canal or something. We bought it, we paid for it, it's ours. There you are. Something like um, that. See, uh, history does count. Um, and I'm glad to know that we are in a historically sound uh, setting. Um, the point being that being able to develop a new relationship with Panama over the canal cost enormous amounts of effort for the administration in internal domestic American politics. And um, now uh, we come to another sentence which has the same, the same problem. Um, this is where you were nice to me and so I have to be uh, bad in order to, to you, Joe, to balance it out. Uh, quote, for a few years, the OAS became an effective element in hemispheric governance, and it looked as if it would become the chosen instrument of Latin American agency in collective action. That's fine, except for the fact that the OAS has one dominant country in it, the United States, which still today pays 60% of its budget and which uh, certainly had no interest in the OAS becoming an effective or chosen instrument of agency and collective action. Uh, and it's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting uh, kind of issue. Um, I was elected in an election which actually I managed in spite of the opposition of Mexico, which loved me, and I mean, you should have heard the Mexicans talk about me once I was elected, but which opposed me because they said the Americans already have too much power. What is this? And I was not named because the Americans wanted to name me. I was named because Peru Bolivia and Ecuador came together and exercised their agency to override the objections of the Inter-American Bureau of the State Department and of the White House, which didn't want an American in that role. And they simply outmaneuvered them and finally um, they gave in because I certainly was not gonna run for office as an American without the support of my government. So I finally got it, but I got it with the help of the foreigners. Now, and for a while I was able to make some things work because the one thing I really was good at was at making the American government more or less deliver. And if you deliver a little bit, that's a lot when nobody had been delivering anything else. Uh, my predecessor had been writing letters to the Secretary of State to communicate. Um, The United States can't be an absentee. If the OAS is ever going to work, it has to have not only the financial support, which the US is more or less doing well on, the problem today is Brazil and Venezuela, but rather the political presence. And we haven't had an ambassador at the OAS for over a year. And uh, it's not enough to have the a pretty building in town where people can meet and talk unless the Americans are saying something. If they're not saying anything, then of course people are gonna run the other way and do other things and uh, nothing is going to work. Uh, now, Talchin's book explains why that is so. History, memory, and asymmetry. Cooperation internationally takes trust. That takes time. It takes the ability of the decision makers to take conscious decisions and steps to reduce or contain the residues of history and of memory and of asymmetries in power. And uh, maybe I uh, will stop there because I don't want to look like an old man who's gone sour.
So <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Luigi. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't think anybody would accuse you of that, um, Luigi. These were just uh, three extraordinary presentations. Um, I'd like to thank, uh, before he has to take off, Andrew Seeley, Vice President of the Wilson Center, for joining us uh, for this. He is a former member of the LAP team, um, worked with, with Joe and, and all of us um, way back when, and uh, thank you for, for sitting through. I'd also like to thank um, Karina Pena for her help in organizing this. Um, Katie Hyde, who has been an intern with us, and today, sadly, tragically for us, is her last day. So if you would like to make a comment or pose a question, um, please wait for the microphone, and please do us the, um, the honor of introducing yourself so we can all know who's in the room. A little hard to respond to all of that. There's a lot on the, on the table. Um, does anybody want to take a first crack? Stunned no doubt, into silence. Thoughts, questions? Uh, sure, let's take this gentleman and then Ambassador Maisto. Uh, perhaps this isn't the most uh, <clears throat> proper question considering the sort of the overarching general. Um, you, your name? Up a oh, sorry. Please. And, and your name, please. I'm uh, sorry. My name is David Drew. I'm an intern here at the Wilson Center. I had a very particular question, and this is, it perhaps might be better to answer this after everyone else has answered their questions, but um, when the Panama Canal initially fell underneath American control uh, many, many decades ago, um, my understanding is that Chile sent a battle cruiser to contest that American action. I, I don't know, was, like, was that ever a potential flashpoint for a broader Latin American action to contest American control over the Panama Canal? No, that they know. I'm sorry, you said Chile sent a battle cruiser? I believe it was the, the Chilean cruiser Esmeralda. Sorry, I'm a bit of a naval historian. No, I haven't heard that. Well, uh, to look up, the, to look up. For uh, remember, the U.S. not only stole it fair and square but, and paid for it, or whatever the quote is, but built it. So uh, they would have had to challenge what? The independence of Panama from Colombia? Uh, certainly not. I mean, the Panama Canal in that period <clears throat> had the weight of the moonshot, or the putting man on the moon, in a more recent period. I mean, when uh, Victor Raul Aya de la Torre um, creates APRA, uh, there is a passage of extraordinary um, eloquence about the Panama Canal and the ability of man to control nature, then, of course, Aya de la Torre wants to use that strength and ability to, uh, to make a, a, an indigenous revolution in the hemisphere. But I think um, the idea that um, there was a resistance uh, to the manipulation of the Americans by some Panamanians uh, to obtain their independence. Well, I don't the, think the so. U.S. actually supported um, the Panamanian independence movement against Colombia precisely so that it could have access to of the course, to of the course. right. To but the, that was the U.S. Right. That was the U.S. Correct. No, oh. I just wanted to say that there was one instance of a possible war between Chile and the United States at the end of the 19th century, in which as a result of a fight between sailors in Valparaiso in which two or three American sailors were killed, um, the American government demanded Chile some sort of compensation which was not accepted, and then the two fleets uh, began to move. I have to recall that Chile had at the time, after the War of the Pacific, the most important fleet probably in the South Pacific. And uh, there are recent, his, there are recent, uh, there is recent research. There is recent research saying that uh, the confrontation between the two navies uh, would have been difficult to to have a, a predictable result. I mean, it was not clear what would happen. Fortunately, there was no war. Great, um, Ambassador John Maisto, former U.S. ambassador to the OAS, please. Thank you, Dr. Ernst. First of all, 
Thank you, Dr. Aronson, for putting this together. Thank you, Joe Tolchin. I haven't read your book. I'm anxious to read it. I know, I know. Right. <laughs> We're, every, everyone's going to buy it, and if there's not enough copies outside, you'll grab right. the flyer. Right. So that's, that's the mandate as we go uh, forward. Ask for the senior <laughs> discount, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you. I will do that. <laughs> not because you have old friends, but because you have that's right. old friends. No, it's, no. it's become a way of life Bad with me to ask for senior discount. Um, Los que estamos en la tercera edad, como no, como no, y, y quién sabe, tal vez la cuarta. <laughs> um, a suggestion. This discussion has been so rich, has been so wonderful. I would hope that somehow it could be collected because there are so many great quotes that all of you have put together, so many insights. Uh, it could accompany the book. I fervently hope that you can do that. Second, Luigi Ainaudi once more reminds us that history matters. And I know, Dr. Tolchin, in your book, this will be reflected. I think all of us will come up with some quibbles. I commend Ambassador Valdez for his memory about Iraq and Chile, because I was in the White House. And I do remember the decision. And I do remember the emotion. And I do remember the outcome. And it was exactly as you described. I would only add that President Bush's respect for President Lagos was very, very high. They understood each other in ways that many Latin Americanists perhaps would find difficult to understand. I think Ambassador Ainaudi really explained the asymmetry and the drama of the OAS. It's very important to keep all of that in mind. Uh, but I want to offer a couple of, I haven't read the book, but I'm wondering about two things that I think have made a difference uh, in the United States and Latin America interaction. One of them is the Peace Corps. I think it is part of the soft power of the United States of the Kennedy, from the Kennedy years to the present, that the best of the United States has been set forth in the Peace Corps. And I think it has made a difference, in my lifetime at least, in terms of understanding. Uh, the second is, I don't know, Joe, if you said anything about the U.S. military. Because I would submit that one of the reasons the Latin American militaries are where they are with regard to respect for democratic governance has had to do with the institutional role uh, of the United States quietly over the years. I think, uh, and I think that the Southern Command <laughs> has done a quite a commendable job and that our military assistance missions have done good work. Leaving aside the interventions, by the way, and the alleged interventions, I love the story about the little man someplace pulling all the strings together because that's the way a lot of people think, not only in Latin America, but in other parts of the world. But I would be anxious to see how Dr. Tolchin treats uh, those two things that I mentioned. Thank you, Joe, for doing it. Thank you, Embajador. Thank you, yes. Embajador. Thanks. Joe, please. John Maisto uh, raises an interesting point. There's a, a long-standing argument among students of inter-American relations uh, as to the comparative importance or weight of the seemingly divergent but simultaneous objectives of United States policy, national security above all, and the um, export or the extension of what today are called co our core values. And uh, for a long time, especially during the Cold War, amongst academics in the United States and certainly in Latin America, there was a broad consensus and conviction that it was national security policy that dominated policy making, certainly when the two were weighed together. And I try to bring out that the, uh, while uh, that argument may be correct, um, in many episodes recounted in the literature, uh, particularly during the Cold War. Nevertheless, the debate never is absent. 
and I quote an old friend of ours who's no longer with us, uh, who plays a role in several earlier episodes, and that's Pete Fakey, mm. uh, who, because this is now all recorded and uh, we have access to vast amounts of information, uh, including that presidential memo to which Luigi referred, um, as well as minutes uh, uh, of which he was author as, um, and so on. And so we, we have uh, the amount of information available to us is dramatically greater today than it was even 20 or 30 years ago. But um, Pete Vakey's, for example, comments in the interministerial meetings over police training uh, in Guatemala is very instructive. My point is that um, there's always debate on the United States side. Uh, as to which should be primary or which should take priority. And as Ambassador Valdez made perfectly clear, the um, importance of that debate to us is sometimes or often lost on Latin Americans who see only one side the results of the debate uh, and um, are, whose historical memory is, is radically different from yours and mine. And uh, what I try to do in the book is to bring out Latin American historical memory. And clearly, as Juan Gabriel pointed out it, gently, to be sure, but made very clear, uh, that from a Latin American perspective, um, I didn't give it enough emphasis. And literally, in the real version of the book, which is supposed to come out at the end of this year, there should be some attention paid in addition to correcting the factual errors that I made. Uh, <laughs> Um, but um, it's clear that historical memory is of tremendous importance. Luigi tells the story of his autobiographical story of his, ex of his experience with Arevalo in, in Chile. Uh, I had experiences exactly like that, though I'm much younger, so mine came a little later. But um, the point is that people who have no knowledge, people in Latin America uh, to whom I spoke, students, uh, college and university students who had no knowledge of the United States except for what they um, understood from the media in their country was convinced about the little man in a, in a small room, first of all, and second that um, of what became to be more elegantly formulated as dependency theory that the United States was totally dominant and uh, we were to blame, quote unquote. So uh, there are a number of times I was escorted out of lecture halls um, uh, by hosts who felt that um, the lack of civility in the audience was a potential danger to their guest. Uh, so I was uh, taken out a back door any number of I mean, this is, these are things that to someone um, such as I, and obviously Luigi is another, uh, spent so much time in Latin America, you can't be ignorant of. And explaining it to a U.S. audience is not always clear, and it perhaps has to be emphasized and brought out a little bit. But, but thank you, John, and I hope you get, when you get to read the book, I expect to get the memo of the errors that you find in it. Great. Diana Negroponte. Perhaps we'll take two questions together. Diana Negroponte, Patricia Fagan. Professor Talchin, thank you very much for an extraordinary presentation by you, Ambassador Valdez, and my good friend Luigi Anaudi. I seek clarification, and it's clarification on your definition of agency. For some of us, agency refers to the man, and hopefully the woman, versus the institution. And you also use the term agency for the determination, the decision of a nation to act, and then subsequently talk about the need for democratic processes to legitimate and be responsible. Yet we know that so much of the history of our hemisphere concerns the actions, the nation's actions, by leaders we can only call autocratic. Mm -hmm. Can you clarify? Well, I um Let's take, okay. but let's take Ted Fagans and then sure. we'll, we'll come back. Uh, and we're we're actually out of time, so we'll yeah, probably I'll take this as the last question and then invite yeah, no, no, okay. people it, to it's, it's, continue it's informally. Like, it's like the last class before lunch, Patricia. 
Right. We're, before, except the it's not lunch. It's, before the cocktails. Before the cocktails. I, under, I fully uh, accept the responsibility for this, but <laughs> please. Um, no, this is unfortunately it's in, unrelated to Diana's good point. But I, I, you've all made, you've all convinced us that agency and autonomy in Latin America is strong, and it shouldn't be just pegged to subservience to the U.S. It's simply not the case. But I notice that in the discussion or in, and in the book, the Europeans are pretty much absent with reason. This book is not about European relations. This book is about U.S.-Latin American relations. That's clear. But I wonder if, um, I looked in the index, there's a couple of, there are a few pages, a few references, several references to Europe in general, to individual European countries. Are there any European interventions or, or, or um, inter attempts to influence this relationship that come to mind and that have been really important have turned things around? Okay, two meaty questions on which to conclude. Let's make this the final r round of comments. So we'll start with Joe and anyone else who wants to add. Well, Patricia, uh, uh, there is one case with which you're familiar, with which you were involved um, as an actor, and that is during the civil wars of Central America in the, in the 1980s. The Spanish and the French, social democratic governments both, attempted to move the United States uh, without success. And I had, uh, was doing some work in Madrid at the time and um, had, a, had the occasion to speak to the foreign minister who um, expressed frustration at how sort of tone deaf the United States government was from his perspective and that of the group of European states, um, or governments rather, um, which he attempted to uh, represent. So, and there are other examples. Uh, none of them. The point, I think, to add here, without getting into a longer discussion of it, Juan Gabriel made an uh, important point as to the role of globalization. Uh, just That's enough just to start a conversation. The role of globalization obviously lends greater weight to the potential role of Europe, uh, not just in trade, but in geopolitics of all sorts, the environmental issues, uh, and on and on and on and on. So as globalization becomes more dense or advances, whatever metaphor you wish, you'll find that the Latins on their side expressing agency, seeking agency, will become more adroit in involving other parties, such as the Europeans. And the reverse or the complementary actions by the Europeans will become more frequent. Uh, with regard to the definition of agency, uh, you got to read the first five pages of the book. Um, it, is, uh, a to it is a concept taken from psychology in which it refers to an individual. I didn't say man. I said an individual. I'm allowing female agency here. Um, but it is used now in a variety of social sciences, including political science and anthropology, in a collective manner. So groups have agency. It's now used in business schools. F corporations can have agency, and so on and so forth. Um, so uh, the collective agency is what interests me. And the, the issue of legitimate policy comes out of the historical study that it's extremely important in the United States in the late colonial and independence periods that policy be legitimate. And of course, in the Monroe Doctrine, the expression is repeated and continues. And one of the reasons um, that even later governments are um, disdainful of Latin, U.S. governments are disdainful of Latin America because they don't think they are truly legitimate governments. That is to say, they're not elected. Juan Gabriel raises an interesting point as to how what the nature of U.S. democracy was, and certainly was an oligarchical country, it was a country with slavery and so on and so forth. Um, but it's quite remarkable, uh, actually, uh, how broad the conversation was among the colonies at the end of the colonial period about foreign policy, foreign relations, and how broad across the geography of the young nation was that discussion. And there's nothing like that anywhere in Latin America at the time of independence. There are groups talking about the role of Argentina, for example, in international affairs, the Venezuela, and so on. But you can't find anything comparable to that um, broad popular discussion of the role of foreign policy and why the government should have a role in international affairs in 1790 or in 1785 which is quite remarkable. And the absence of it is what I'm trying to 
draw attention. And then when I see it coming, as I do, and the Diego Portales cases are earlier than I cited, and uh, they'll be in the Spanish edition mm -hmm. for sure, uh, but I'm struck by uh, the early appearances of it. And the language the Chilenos use in the 1860s is precisely the language to be used by the Brazilians in the 1890s and by Roosevelt and his followers in the 1880s and 1890s. It is universal, down to the racism, the hubris of arrogance of racism. The Chilenos think of the Peruvians as a bunch of ignorant animals. The language that Theodore Roosevelt then uses in talking about monkeys in Bogota who are opposed to progress. I mean, the uniformity, all of these nations were up to date, the elites in all of these nations were up to date about the discussions of international affairs. They'd all read the European authors, all of them. And sadly, they'd also all imbibed the early science of racism in the 19th century. And it's remarkable to read the elites in Chile, Argentina, and uh, Peru, excuse me, in Brazil and Mexico, asserting their racial superiority over certain groups either in their own society or in a neighboring society. The Mexicans consider the Central Americans animals, their word, the Brazilians, and, you know, and so on. And that is universal, an intellectual spread of ideas which doesn't begin to change until Aida um, Torre and others who bring indigenism and Vasconcelos, Vasconcelos and so on. That's, and not, that's in the book, too. You'll yeah. No, no, it's there. Juan Gabriel, por favor. Yes, I would like to make just one comment on, 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 on the European uh, question. Um, it is true that all of Palme was absolutely essential in the organization of the Contadora group and that, uh, that the Swedes and the French were particularly involved. Um, but the importance of Europe in terms of foreign policy in, in Latin America was around the permanent efforts to integrate the region. It was the European integration that led Latin Americans, for instance, to create El Pacto Andino at the time. And this is not uh, strange if we perceive that our political systems were based in European models. The most important political party probably in the history of the region in terms of permanence and influence, intellectual influence, expansion on over Latin America apart from the PRI, of course, is the Christian Democratic Party of Chile. And the Christian Democratic Party of Chile was permanently related to the Italian Democratic, Christian Democratic Party. Amintore Fanfani, who was somebody whom no American politician would have considered as, I mean, they didn't know the name probably, was a very popular figure in Latin America. Uh, the most important book written on Latin American integration at the time has an introduction written by Amin Tore Fanfani, who was prime, prime minister of Italy. Then the importance of Italians, French and Germans after, particularly Germans, on the development of Latin American politics and on the development of the integration, on the visions of integration of Latin America is extremely important. Yes, uh, and let me let me strengthen that not not on the Italian side, um, <laughs> but on the political party side, um, the Germans in particular through the Stiftungen, yes, um, had an enormous impact. Uh, on the Christian Democratic International was your father an officer of the Christian Democratic International at some point? At some point. At some point, he probably was. Paco Ambassador Villagrán's father was vice president of the Socialist International, um, representing Guatemala uh, at some point. And the, um, the Conrad Adenauer Foundation was the, uh, was the Christian Democratic one, which, and it's interesting, these influences do not just run to Latin America, they also affect the United States. Um, it was the Conrad Adenauer Foundation that provided the support and the money to give a political international recognition and base to Jose Napoleon Duarte. Yes. 
um, who, uh, without whom uh, United States policy in El Salvador would have had a very difficult time. Um, and it was Duarte working with some of these um, political internationals and a number of Americans among whom I could be counted um, who made, created the work um, in the Reagan administration uh, that led to the founding of the National Endowment for Democracy. Uh, the idea being that um, the United States also should have some means of uh, solidarity um, with uh, political movements and activity. Uh, the difference is, of course, that our political system is very different from the generally uh, European and uh, Latin American one, where for a long time there were some ideological parties and roots. They've all, it's another part of the change times, uh, both there and here. Uh, but the European impact um, can be there uh, it's easy to, uh, to ignore it, but it's easy to ignore everything. Um, I mean, you can, we can all turn into little Trumps. Dear me. <laughs> well, I don't want to end on that note. I'd actually like to follow up. I would like to follow up on one quick, uh, with one quick observation, um, taking off on what John Maestro said about the Peace Corps. Um, part of, Juan Gabriel, part of your comments talked about the importance of Latin Americans during a time of exile, getting to know more about the United States and being educated in the United States. I think that's one of Joe's points as well. I think the Peace Corps played a similar role in reverse. In if reverse. you think, exactly if you right. think exactly. of Senator Tim Kaine, Peace Corps volunteer in Honduras, uh, Congressman Sam Farr, Peace Corps volunteer in Colombia, Mark Schneider, Peace Corps volunteer in El Salvador, Chris Richard Dodd. Chris Dodd, also, Richard and Richard Feinberg, Peace Corps volunteer in Chile. These are people who have had very important roles um, in shaping U.S. Latin American policy from wherever they have sat or or, or uh, been elected, and um, and are rooted in that foundational experience of living in Latin America and appreciating a different reality. Anyway, please um, join us in the adjacent room in the sixth floor boardroom uh, for a Copa de Honor to celebrate the, the book and, and this uh, gathering of um, old and young friends. Um, and please join me in, uh, in a round of applause to thank our, our speakers. Bueno, yeah. where was where did Chris serve? Where did Chris Dodd serve? Where was he?